Let us cultivate the aspiration seeking complete enlightenment for the sake of liberating infinite kind mother sentient beings and with that kind of altruistic motivation we call bodhicitta motivation that we should all participate in this teaching we need a question i think yeah. <coughs> I believe that um, um, just as we as uh, individuals uh, are seeking freedom from suffering and we are seeking uh, lasting happiness and we are seeking methods or the ways with which we can uh, free ourselves from suffering and find uh, lasting happiness. Uh, but these kinds of uh, aspirations or wishes, if you will, are also found in the minds of uh, all other uh, sentient beings. So in those respects, uh, uh, we and others are uh, just the same. We are all seeking ways to find lasting peace and happiness and uh, to get rid of uh, suffering for good. So in other words, all of us, uh, you know, wish to be able to uh, find uh, uh, or fulfill the ultimate uh, purpose of uh, our life. In order to uh, fulfill the ultimate uh, goal or the purpose of our lives, it is uh, essential for us uh, to be able to, uh, you know, uh, find a way to fulfill the ultimate goal or the purpose of uh, other sentient beings. Uh, if we somehow don't uh, care about them, there's really no way to bring about uh, the complete fulfillment of uh, our own life. That's why I'm going to say that 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 I'm going to say
Bodhisattvas um, see this very clearly, if you will, that in order to bring about the uh, ultimate goal of their life or the ultimate fulfillment of their life, they really need to, uh, you know, uh, fulfill the betterment of uh, 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 the lives of other sentient beings. And because of that, they are so dedicated uh, to uh, promote the well-being of uh, other sentient beings. So that the corner of the day is that Randu and Yendu Nish Nanita Yendu and Tso Nangu. In other words, what I'm trying to get across to you is this. Uh, that bodhisattvas recognize that others are more important themselves, and therefore fulfillment of others' uh, well-being is more important than fulfilling one's selfish uh, uh, interest. And uh, with that kind of understanding and attitudes, uh, bodhisattvas are, uh, you know, oriented towards and dedicated uh, towards uh, benefiting uh, other beings. Uh, to put it in another way, um, both the suffers, you know, uh, they make uh, a choice between self-cherishing attitude and cherishing other sentient beings. Given these two options, bodhisattvas, they prefer and they choose cherishing others rather than cherishing uh, oneself. Bodhisattvas uh, do recognize their selfishness or self-centeredness, self-cherishing attitude, is a poison. It's like a poison. So how come uh, self-cherishing attitude is um, uh, seen as uh, you know, uh, poison by bodhisattvas? Because bodhisattvas understand it very well that uh, when we indulge in self-cherishing in attitudes and actions, then in the process what happens is we do not really uh, care about other sentient beings and we neglect the well-being of other sentient beings. So that is an obstacle uh, to benefit sentient beings. And, uh, so, and from that point of view, they see self-centeredness as, uh, as like an enemy. Yeah, to be able to understand um, uh, this notion of uh, self-centeredness or self-cherishing attitude, rank change in Tibetan, as like a poison, we have to understand how when we are being influenced by self-cherishing attitude or if we let ourselves being controlled and influenced by self-cherishing attitude, then what happens is we find ourselves indulging in the, uh, negative uh, uh, actions and which produce negative uh, results or consequences. And these consequences uh, you know, uh, include uh, uh, all kinds of uh, sicknesses that we do not want to experience, but nonetheless we do in the world. And we do not want any kind of war and destructions and killings going on, but we do see a lot of that. 
And we do not want anybody in the world to uh, starve to death, do not have enough even basic necessities of life, uh, but we do see starvations uh, you know, occurring in the world. So all of these bad things happening in the world, if you will, are the results of negative karmic actions which are related with uh, self-centeredness or self-cherishing attitude. Mm. ตัดอินเดียเนชีชานิดูซันตามิตาบาสตาราราซูซูดูซันซันตามบีนาราลเมเดเปริกคันเดจิชุมเบยินะเนนาซาตานอะเนเซนดุเนตาดิตาลาซ
So in order to cultivate uh, great love and great compassion to, you know, uh, for sentient beings, what we also need is among the methods that we need to really uh, apply or uh, put into practice uh, is that we should be able to see how sentient beings have been kind to us. We need to uh, recall in our mind uh, the kindnesses of uh, sentient beings. So we, in our ordinary way of remembering kindness is usually, you know, we only, uh, seems like that only applies to people we know, friends and families and uh, uh, that, you know, the, yes, so-and-so so have been kind to me, so I remember his or her or their kindnesses, uh, but we will never think, uh, talk about or even think about uh, remembering kindness of strangers. You know, that makes no sense to us. Like, what do you mean? Strangers have been kind to us. Or maybe that's not too much of a pro problematic to think about, but when you think about, oh, we remember the kindness of enemies, you say, well, what is that? That completely makes no sense to us. You know, what do you mean? Like, enemies have been kind to you. Uh, and uh, so just forget about that whole thing. Uh, so that's uh, how we are ordinarily habituated uh, in seeing certain people as friends and relatives and then being kind to us and then all other strangers and special enemies as like, you know, and, you know, unkind or, you know, even they can't talk about, you know, their kind, kindness towards us. That can raise some sense, some so if we find ourselves thinking in the, those thoughts I just mentioned, or we even talk about it, you know, uh, like, you know, forget about the kindness of this, you know, uh, you know, John Doe, uh, or whatever. I mean, that's really what shows is, um, you know, the limitation of our perceptions, that we are basically thinking about one lifetime, just of this life. You know, we are not able to break this mentality of going beyond, you know, this life. We think as if this is the only life that exists, and this is the only, whatever is happening in this life, that's what it is. And we couldn't go beyond the scope of this thought, and that's the problem. That's the limiting uh, factor. Uh -huh. So what's happening is that we, you know, have not thought about, uh, you know, a life before and life after and how, you know, relationships and things change over, uh, you know, lifetimes. And, uh, but when we really think about these, I uh, mean, issues, uh, which are interconnected in many ways and are very dynamic in the sense that things don't remain just the same in, in you know, uh, all the time. Say so those who have been very dear and near to us in this lifetime, in our past life, it may not necessarily be that they were again very nice, close and uh, close and dear to us. I mean, they could have been us, I mean, strangers or enemies, you know. Or that uh, those who were enemies in our previous lifetime, who really did nasty things to us, but maybe in this life they have become our family members and friends. It's just that we don't recognize all these changes and the interconnectedness uh, and, uh, you know, uh, how all these things are, are, are operating, you know, functioning. No, no. Send 
you know, how like relationships, you know, change and uh, the relationships are dynamic in that. It, you know, they may not remain the same. I don't think we even have to that, go that far to understand that, you know, uh, uh, you know, life before and life now and life after. But things just in this lifetime, we can find plenty of examples of what I'm talking about. And, they, they, you know, there are cases where in the early part of one's life, you know, uh, you know, we, uh, we, uh, you know, uh, maybe two people are great friends. They are the greatest friends in the world. While something happens and changes, and in the later part of the world, uh, you know, life, they become great enemies of each other. Or that in the early part of the life, two people are kind of strangers, or maybe they are enemies. They really don't like each other much. But then somehow things get resolved between them and reconciled, and later they become the greatest friends in the world. So what do these things tell us? That relationships are not fixed. You know, these things are dynamic, and uh, they change according to time, circumstances, the causes, and conditions. So when we talk about uh, remembering how sentient beings have been kind to us, of course we have to find many avenues and reasons to uh, uh, generate this kind of understanding and mentality that you know, how in our many lifetimes you know, we have formed different connections with sentient beings and uh, so uh, they have been kind to us in many different ways. Alejandro I think we can find you know, plenty of many different ways to think about how sentient beings have been kind to us that are very coming into existence is uh, because of other sentient beings. Just look at this body, which we call my body, and cherish it so much. While this body is produced by some other people, you know, we didn't make this body on our own. We didn't come into the world with our own body. See, somebody made it, us. You know, we inherited, if you will, this physical form from, you know, through the kindness of some other people. You know? And now we think in terms of um, all the basic necessities of life that we, uh, that we need. All those things are, you know, uh, as I say, have come to us through the uh, interdependence and kindness of other sentient beings. Because we don't grow food on our own, you see. We don't, uh, as I say, we, all those, a lot of things in our lives are the products and uh, are the uh, results of the efforts of many other people and sentient beings. So when we think along those lines and we see how sentient beings, we are interconnected with sentient beings and they have been kind to us many uh, different ways, then to be unkind to them is very unbecoming, right? This we understand in the world. If somebody has been kind to you, and if you turn out to be, you know, vicious person and unkind to that person, what would the world say? They just, you know, think you are the, you know, the craziest person on the earth. How could you be so unkind to someone who has been kind to you? This is exactly what we're talking about. Considering that sentient beings have been very kind to us in many different ways, and we recognize this, now, if we hurt them, we do something bad to them. Now, that's being very ungrateful uh, and unbecoming. Now, I'm connecting this uh, to the uh, point I made before, like uh, we need to cultivate great love and great compassion uh, for sentient beings. Now, you might be thinking or even want to ask this question, you know, now how does this, you know, relate to cultivating love and compassion for sentient beings? How does remembering the kindness of other sentient beings is related to, you know, love and compassion? Mm -hmm. 
Pame and the Tapu will serve a chimbuch in the ones. Sons at a rang pugu to let them never listen to that never of Jishon Sona. Pama de Pesh of Vita did it never tell you to a tough condition in a co, she had a sound to us. Let's consider this example of uh, parents, you know, love for uh, their children. The parents have so much love and concern for their children that basically whatever is within their reach and abilities, they try to do everything to help, you know, uh, address the problems encountered by uh, their children. It's because they have so much love and concern for the children. You know, parents, when they see that their children are sick, I mean, how much they wish their you know, children to, be, uh, to recover from sickness. They really wish them to be free from sickness. That's a compassion, you know, to their children. So when their children are doing really well, they still wish that and may the best of the things happen to them. That is called wishing, you know, that's a love, you know, wishing the children to have the best of everything. Uh, I want to just you know, explain uh, though very briefly what uh, you know love and compassion um, uh, 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 is. Uh, that when we see any uh, person or sentient being uh, who is suffering, if we truly wish that person to be free from suffering, we wish, you know, how nice it would be if this person is free of uh, his or her, or uh, you know, suffering. And we feel it in, as you might say, in the very gut of ourselves, that just as if we ourselves have that suffering, we do, don't want it, right? We want to be out of that suffering. So as much as we want to be out of that suffering, free from, we wish this person to be free from suffering, that feeling is called compassionate feeling. That's what compassion is. No, no. That's Shamba Sayate. Shamba Sayate. And the Devata, Devi Jota, then the Chemarum Sambita, Samba Shu Trabusheva Teller. Shamba Sayate. Now, the love is another attitude where we wish others to be happy and to find the happy, uh, causes of happiness. So when we wish others to do well, to be happy, to be peaceful, you know, uh, that kind of thought constitutes, you know, love. So when we pame pugula we wish others to be happy, to be peaceful, to be happy, 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 so just as I explained that, you know, good parents, maybe that's what I have had, good parents here, Kishila didn't use the qualification here. Uh, and so they have so much love and compassion for their children, as I uh, just briefly explained. When their children are doing well, they're very happy, and they wish every success and the best of everything happened to their children. That's how they feel in the very, uh, you know, core of their heart and mind. That is loving children, love for children. When the children are in problems, and they wish so much, you know, uh, them to be free from those problems and see what they can do, actually, to help address the issues. And that kind of feeling that the parents have in the heart and the mind is called compassion. Now, good children who understand, you know, how much their parents love and care for them, so, you know, they, you know, would like to reciprocate 
you know, the, the, the love and compassion of their parents. And then, you know, when they are able to do something for their parents, if parents are in problems, they wish sincerely their parents to be free from problems. They wish they can do something about it. That is the reciprocal getting compassion, you know, uh, to and um, for, uh, for parents. So when, the, you know, the parents are happy, they wish their parents to be happy, uh, and the, all the best of things happen to them, that is reciprocating love, you know, uh, uh, to and for their parents. So this is how the good parents and good children are bound together by love and compassion, and they really remember how each of them have been kind to each other, and uh, so this is how, I mean, you know, uh, uh, how should I say, how it should be. You know, the, the, this is how the love, compassion, and remembering kindnesses are all interrelated with each other. <laughs> Tetal Hassam Jane, to some but any, and a Sanguin Serum, but your Ranger is saved, that's all here is. In order to experience uh, altruistic mind of enlightenment or bodhicitta, um, the three principal causes that we must cultivate are great love, Mahametri, great compassion, Mahakaruna, and uh, uh, what we call special thought or willpower, Laksam, the sense that, uh, you know, of taking the responsibility upon oneself to, uh, how do you say, uh, uh, to, 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 to benefit sentient beings. No, no. That is simple thing. And then, that is the only one thing. That is the only one number of the terms. And that is the only thing you say about the Ranjik Yoris. So when we truly experience these three different attitudes, great love, great compassion, special thought, or willpower, then bodhicitta or altruism, bodhisattva's attitude really arises uh, from these uh, uh, attitudes. So whenever uh, bodhicitta or altruism uh, genuinely arises in one's mind, it is at that point of time that the individual or the person has entered into the Mahayana path. Uh, in order to become a Buddha, to be a complete enlightened person, it is a must that one uh, cultivates and experiences bodhicitta. In other words, we cannot find an example of a Buddha uh, who has become Buddha but never develop bodhicitta. We cannot find that kind of a Buddha as an example. <laughs> Well, as talking about the bodhicitta and its importance and, you know, that it is a must, uh, you know, that we should cultivate to become a Buddha. Now, it may sound like, okay, so that's the only thing we need to become a Buddha. Now, if you ask the question, so is that all we need to become a Buddha, bodhicitta? Well, the answer is no. There is something more. We need to integrate it with, combine it with, the wisdom realizing the ultimate nature of phenomena called emptiness or shunyata. Now, how can we cultivate the wisdom realizing emptiness as it is, if you ask? Well, there are many ways to approach it, but one of the best ways to cultivate understanding of emptiness is if we understand how things exist dependently, how things are interconnected with each other, and how things are produced you know, uh, uh, I mean, uh, uh, how, how things, uh, uh, about, uh, I shouldn't say produce, uh, how things exist, you know, dependently. In the sense of called Pratit Samudpa, things are dependently originated. That's what I'm saying. I'm saying, 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 I
The fact of the matter is, there isn't any phenomenon, phenomenon meaning something that exists, which is not in the nature of emptiness. Emptiness is not the same as uh, non-existence. If you think that, oh, emptiness means, okay, now nothing exists at all. Okay, so everything is kind of, uh, you know, not there at all. Well, that kind of a notion of emptiness is wrong, and it is a nihilistic uh, view of uh, emptiness. When we talk about emptiness, we really need to understand empty of what? You know, when we say phenomena are in emptiness, what do we mean, empty of what? So that's very important to understand. So to answer that question, phenomena are empty of what? Well, empty of what we call inherent existence or objective existence. Phenomena do not exist you know, objectively, meaning in and of themselves. Nothing exists from its own side. Things are either dependent on their causes and conditions, so that is another uh, meaning of dependent arising, or everything that exists is nothing but a mere label, that's a name tag almost, mere label on, uh, onto its basis of imputation by terms and concepts. So everything is just label, and nothing exists you know, beyond this, if you will, uh, framework. And another reason why we must, uh, you know, cultivate uh, bodhicitta or the altruistic mind of enlightenment and the wisdom gone beyond, wisdom realizing emptiness, if you ask, is because for us to become an enlightened being, Buddha, we must get rid of the two types of mental obscuration. One is simply called delusions or afflictive emotions, klesia, nyurmo in Tibetan, and other is called obscuration to omniscience. And we have to get rid of these two types of mental obscuration completely to become a Buddha. So now what helps us to get rid of these two types of mental obscuration, if you ask? Well, this is where uh, bodhicitta and the wisdom realizing emptiness come into play. Because it's through cultivating bodhicitta and realizing emptiness as it is and combining these two paths, we should be able to get rid of uh, the two types of mental obscuration. <laughs> So if you're wondering, you know, where are these two types of obscuration, all of us who are called ordinary sentient beings, all of us have them within our own mind. These mental obscurations exist in our mind, and they are not something visible to our uh, what called uh, uh, visual consciousness. They're not something we can see or show to each other. Uh, but nonetheless, they exist in our mind, and in certain cases, they exist in the form of um, predispositions or mental imprints or latent latency. Sorry. Well, no, that's
when we talk about uh, uh, Buddha or an, a complete enlightened person, we are really literally talking about uh, 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 you know uh, someone who is completely free of all kinds of defilements and negativities. And it's a complete perfect human being, uh, person, not human being, perfect person, and who is free of all the faults and negativities and obscurations, but who is uh, endowed with all the realizations and uh, quality, good qualities. So such a person is seen as a Buddha, enlightened being. So the complete enlightened state is characterized by those qualities. <laughs> So when we say that, you know, we are seeking uh, complete enlightenment or we are seeking to be a Buddha, that's what we're talking about. We want to be a perfect, uh, you know, uh, how do you say, enlightened uh, being who is free of all the faults and negativities and mental obscurations, but who has all the realizations and uh, uh, qualities. Uh, well, it is wonderful to make, uh, you know, prayers to become a Buddha, or uh, wonderful to recite uh, mantras, uh, you know, incantations to become Buddha. But that those things are not enough, as I always say. Because when you look at complete enlightened state, what is complete enlightened state? What do we mean by Buddha? Now, having defined it very simply, uh, which I just did, now, I mean, do you think that just simply praying to be a Buddha or to reciting a mantra would be enough to become a Buddha? No. So this is why we need to educate ourselves, you know, um, on the complete structure of the path and what are the things we need to get rid of and how do we do that and what are the qualities we need to cultivate and how do we do that so we have to first get you know good education understanding of all these issues and that comes through listening to teaching and study and once we have understood what the Buddha has taught we really understand the meaning of Buddha's teachings as presented in uh, discourses or sutras and in the commentary treatises or shastras. Now once we got that good understanding, now we need to put the teaching into practice. So this is where the cultivation practice or the meditation comes into play. So through meditation and practice, we develop experiences in our mind. And through these experiences and developing these experiences further, then we become, uh, you know, uh, uh, you know, we, we, we progress on the paths and grounds and uh, leading to uh, enlightened, uh, enlightened state. That is the of the Sengi Kandachin, Lu Kandachin, and Pena, that Chung Chung, the Maski Dogs on Jinaya, call on this Nimati and Sanji Totman to your terrace. Some of yours. So Buddhism believes that every sentient being has the potentiality to become a Buddha one day. And so it doesn't matter what are the sizes and the shapes or the forms and are. You know, as you heard, Geshe used the English word mosquitoes. And even the mosquitoes in the present situation seem like they cannot be Buddha, but they do have the potentiality to become Buddhas, you know, someday. That is believe Changba Maris Karis and call repeat on it. Some not on it. So when we say that every sentient being down to the smallest insect has the potentiality to become Buddha, we are not saying it just, you know, uh, because it's a nice thing to say, uh, you know, but, but there's really good reason and, uh, I mean, uh, a rational behind, uh, behind the claim. <laughs> Tanda, 
When we uh, study uh, the life stories of, um, uh, you know, those who have already become Buddhas, Buddhas known to us, uh, including our historical teacher Shakyamuni, uh, you know, there was a time when they were as ordinary and as deluded uh, as we are now. And uh, so that's what's important, you know, to understand. Maybe it was many, many eons before, but uh, nonetheless, there was a time that those who are Buddhas now, they were just like any of us. But then they really made a big decision and they changed their attitudes completely. Instead of cherishing themselves at the cost of others, they you know, change the attitudes uh, and replace that with the cherishing thought of others. They pursued that path, and then they eventually become what we now recognize as Buddhas. But we, we are there with them. But we just kind of remain and continue to in the same uh, habit of cherishing ourselves more than others. And this is why we got stuck. So they went ahead of us and we got stuck. But otherwise we were all same at one point of, uh, you know, time. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So what I said earlier was that according to Buddhist uh, you know, literatures, every sentient being has the potentiality to become a Buddha enlightened being someday. Okay, that is a Buddhist claim, and I said that's based on sound reason and rational. It's not something, just a rhetoric, or it's, you know, uh, a good thing to say. But when I say that every sentient being has the potentiality to become Buddha, but one must not misunderstand it to mean to say that, okay, now Buddhism believes that, you know, the... You know, the rocks and the trees and the, the you, know, uh, you know, all these twigs and all of this will someday become Buddha. No, they are, these are called inanimate phenomena or objects. Inanimate phenomena will never become uh, Buddhas. We cannot talk about a tree becoming Buddha someday or a flower becoming Buddha someday. We cannot talk about rocks and pebbles someday become a human being and then become a Buddha. You know, the, that's just impossible thing to happen. Human beings never become a rock and trees and flowers, and neither do the trees and flowers and pebbles become humans and sentient beings one day. It just, I mean, uh, so we are not saying that inanimate uh, objects or phenomena have a potency or some kind of a nature to become Buddha one day. No. We are just saying a sentient being by definition is someone who has what called mind or consciousness or state of mind so that kind of a being we call sentient being can one day become a Buddha so so the joint and the kinky pilgrims he be joint the kinky he my he be joint and so my nally tango you do sunny my nally he be joint to you your is so what is really I mean unique about sentient beings is that there is such things as the continuity of a mind stream, mental, you know, continuum from, you know, one life into another life. And that is important. Like when we think of this lifetime, you know, first, when we are conceived in the womb of the mother, you know, consciousness from a previous life entered into the womb of the mother. So that was that continuity maintained. And then throughout in the womb and after birth and so on, so the mental con- uh, consciousness has retained its continuity. 
Wana tati ngara tarang kyoke ngara tsa tsama lo sava tsota ngimba yina ngara tsa tsama lo le pengya kche dengye ta ngara lina tsa 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 yata ngara tsa tsama lo shiwi is. So I thought uh, these are, you know, important things uh, to um, kind of remind uh, myself, remind, uh, you know, uh, others who know about these things, or maybe there's a new, uh, you know, learning and information for uh, new people. No, no. That's because I'm doing something to do with that. You know, you're a Chinese. No. I don't know what you're doing. 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 อ่าเนื้อมันเนื้อมาตาวันเนื้อมาลงเชยเนื้อมาเส้นเนื้อมาเนื้อมันง่ะแต่ดูดูไปดูดิเซสอ่าพอสูดเดินไปดูมันยิ
So like it is said, that even during the time of the Shakyamuni Buddha, the humans would live, uh, you know, about 100 years. And now from then onwards, you know, so many thousand years have passed by, and now the lifespan has decreased. Now today, you know, people live around 65 and, you know, things like that, okay? I know what you're thinking, you know. Uh, but, okay, I'm just translating here. Um, and... Uh, uh, so I think Geshe wants to address this issue um, that, you know, perhaps, uh, you know, thinking like, oh, come on, you know, we have all the technological and medical advancement and people are living longer and longer. That's the one issue we have in society. Well, we are not particularly talking about a particular society, but in a generic sense, are humans anywhere in this Zambudviba continent, so the lifespan has decreased. So that's what we are talking about, so even from Buddha's time onwards. So, uh, so that's a dege- one of the five drags of the degenerations, okay? So then there's what we call uh, uh, you know, degenerated uh, what are delusions. Now you see the word degeneration doesn't work, because that's a good thing. The delusions should degenerate. Yes. But what we really mean is the delusions are becoming more rampant. When Buddha's time, people had delusions. But now, compared to Buddha's time and now, our delusions have become more rampant and more, how you say, worse, intense. And that's the drag. More than 100 uh, times. Yes, uh, it, it is like the intensity has picked more up 100 degree. times more. And uh, so that's considered as one of the degenerations, as you can see, the linguistic problem. You know, I would consider degenerated delusions as good, but here. Yeah. Uh, and then there is the degenerated view. And that is something to do with the wrong views. Now we hold more wrong views, you know, uh, than before. And uh, then there is uh, what we call uh, Genshuna. So we got a life, we got two uh, Yingmati. Yeah, and the degenerated time, this is related to, this is now the things are getting worse at our time. It's related to our time. So we talked about degenerated life, degenerated time, degenerated uh, delusion, which I told you, linguistic problem. It's three, and uh, degenerated view, wrong four, and um, uh, same thing, 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 same ラジャテカレンセナカレンスタロンシェニマセザネタトンソンコンジュテイチョバアラロンシェヤデヤデンジョンドセヨロバパノンシェモドンテンセネノンシェタモネシネドッチンブレノンシェヘマメベナサマン
And then the next, uh, Adesha goes on to say that this is not the time to hold, I'm literally translating here, hold high position, but rather remain humble, hold a humble position. Now we talked about what does it mean to be humble, or the need to cultivate humbleness. Now if we really hold a high position, usually what happens, the high position has involved with politics and then many and you know, hundred many people don't like you and all kinds of risk and dangers in involved in holding a high position. But whereas if one remains very humble, then you know a lot of those issues don't come up. And we have a saying that Masa Komet and saying it's just like if you you know, cultivate the humility and humbleness, that's the source of enlightenment. No, no. Taiti Yumadri. Koyo tembi tu mais yopo mambo jaya ta tembi tu mares ane wempa tembi tu nyeso ne wempa la dene ane ran dunzi ene dunzi ta treva chene ene sem nanto da treva lu dunzi da treva sang 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 me beshe tende che ak tu risk ana ndo and then great Adisha goes on to say that this is not the time to cultivate a lot of followers and servants around you but this is the time to, uh, you know, to find the solitude. And uh, so, you know, th- that's very important because the m- more one builds up uh, followers around oneself or the servants and in you know, all that, then all kinds of disturbances come into one's practice. But rather, if one remains in a solitude, while well, solitude should be understood in two different ways, we isolate our mind from all kind of disturbing conceptions. So that's perhaps more important part of the solitude. We do not want our mind to go berserk and crazy and, you know, uh, you know, um, uh, I should say, churn out all hundred different thoughts, but rather we want to isolate our mind from disturbing conceptions. And then we want also our body to be physically isolated from busyness, you know, just going crazy and, you know, unending things, activities. So solitude is important for one's spiritual development. That is humanity. Floma sell with two minds, Rangi sell with two years, and the Kaloma ten between my Ranga and a pay the two number of a dubby, and the two chairs can and do the Larun and Sondoa. Ranju, Madu, by Jinju, two maris, Sonsa, Tambo, and Ranju to Nduel, Jungris can and Kibari. And then Adisha goes on to tell his students, this is not the time to, uh, how should I say, uh, to cultivate, uh, uh, cultivate students, you know, go and find students and, you know, but this is the time to look at your mind and subdue your mind. Now, this is really important, and I think similar things have been said in the Lamrim treatises. Treatises on stages of path enlightenment, where uh, Majishri Lama Tsongkhapa states clearly, if one does not tame one's mind, subdue one's mind, how can one tame others' mind? There is no way to do that. So if one doesn't tame one's mind, how can you lead others to tame their mind? That's just impossible. So it's the same thing here. So it is very important to focus on one's own self and subdue and tame one's mind rather than try to find followers and you know cultivate uh, you know students well, disciples that is jesus in the rita see jesus with two minds then the same between see so much in it so so in it see so much it's secret then that he but they see see here but the secret then that jump back here but they say she do a maris do maris but in some between you send it then that it's it they then be done that is here but she did and then gone with tourists, that's some with tourists. And then Great Adisha says, this is not a time to be picky about the words and terminologies, but this is the time to contemplate the meaning of the words. You know, so here it's not like you know being uh, so much caught up with uh, the, 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 the the linguistic uh, you know use of the words and terms and uh, you know structures and all that. But this is the time to really reflect on the meanings conveyed by terms and uh, concepts. Nature 
gom jeni sa kil pa dewi tures pa se chamje jeni kama in san doya ti mares kan and then the great atisha says this is not the time to travel around but this is time to sit in one place and do your practice meditation so this is not time to plan touring the world so to speak this is the time to find a place and sit there and do one's practice uh, um, this uh, advice uh, Atisha has given are uh, directly addressed to the monastics, the monks and nuns in the monasteries or nunneries, you know. But of course, there, uh, there are messages that uh, we could derive from his advices for those who are seriously thinking about spiritual practice, even as lay practitioners. There's a lot of uh, messages in these advices uh, for, uh, for us. If one really genuinely wants to practice Dharma, cultivate spirituality, then all these things advised by uh, Great Atisha, was based on his own deep experiences, are very relevant and important. Of course, our teachings uh, originated with Shakyamuni Buddha and passed down through uh, unbroken lineage masters and Adisha, uh, you know, was one of the greatest masters, you know, who uh, received uh, the unbroken lineage transmission of Buddha's teachings and he is often referred to in the praises as, uh, as like the treasure holder of Buddha's teachings. So that means Buddha's advice and teaching have come down to him and he holds those treasures and he's passing down to us that those treasures. I know that, uh, you know, we listen to many teachings and it's hard for us to remember, you know, every teaching uh, we listen to. Uh, but what's really important is whatever uh, we uh, retain uh, in our uh, you know, mind, uh, we should uh, you know, try to pay, uh, I mean, think about the meanings of those teachings and, uh, you know, uh, and, and, and reflect on the meanings and put into uh, practice as much as we can. So we may know little, but we should at least try to put it into practice, and that makes more sense. That is uh, there's a saying that uh, the great body of water in the ocean has come through the collection of drops over a you know, uh, great length of time. And uh, so I think that really gives us a good lesson that we may be collecting drops now, a little drop by drop. If we keep on co collecting the drops, uh, so one day there will be the ocean of uh, teachings in us. So it's important for us to collect drops and uh, then to um, taste the drops, if you will, to reflect on the meaning of whatever teachings, uh, drop-like teachings uh, that we receive and we retain in our mind. Okay. And uh, so this is um, uh, our, uh, like the last Sunday teaching for a while because you know that uh, uh, we have invited uh, His Holiness the Dalai Lama uh, to uh, come and teach us. 
Uh, and um, so we uh, will not have teaching uh, until uh, September 24th, Sunday. So uh, we will not have any like Sunday teachings or Monday meditations or Wednesday uh, uh, teachings or all those up meetings uh, will be suspended until September 24th. And that Sunday, again, we will resume the teaching at the same time, like at 10.30. So until then, uh, we will be busy, uh, you know, uh, doing the final preparation for His Holiness event and also attending his teachings. So Geshe knows that, uh, you know, uh, you will be attending the uh, teachings and we should really listen to His Holiness uh, teachings. That's the same thing, Abu Karim, and I'm going to be and especially new people once you attend his holiness teaching you know the because of his holiness who he is uh, and uh, you know being an enlightened person and with his you know amazing skills that when he teach maybe the same thing you know you get a different sense of understanding he because he has the great skills to communicate the meanings of uh, the teaching so therefore every word that comes from his mouth is very precious and very meaningful and we need to listen very carefully uh, to you know every word of his holiness well, I'll start on that now. Come to show you again uh, we have some prayer requests. Um, uh, prayer request has been made for Sheila Lopez, uh, who died on Tuesday in Arizona, and uh, Henry Andrews, uh, you know, who is uh, you know fighting his life, and um, it seems like he's not expected to live that long. So please, uh, you know, do prayers for him. And prayers have been requested for uh, three people who are, have health problems. Uh, Rose P- Peon, uh, who is uh, having bad uh, back ailment, and so we pray her to be recovered soon from that. And Roy Edwards and Sheila Edwards, um, and uh, so prayers have been requested for them as well. And that's in some other than the same you hear, you know, and the Zula pay never in a yard tired. When you have such a carina, and the Zuni pay upon me, a chinny, a tired, and it that's in the Tendi Duna, and the Zuni show a Yavol Nayak that can take him to Jerusalem. So what I want to say here is that those who are having health issues, you know, whatever their health problems are, we send our thoughts and prayers for them to recover soon from their uh, sicknesses. And for those who have uh, died, we send our thoughts and prayers that may they find a good rebirth. Tarangi by the power of our collective marriage, may Dharma, the source of benefits and happiness, flourishes throughout the universe. May His Holiness the Dalai Lama and all other great holy masters live long and be successful in fulfilling their visions, benefiting sentient beings. May spiritual communities throughout the world 
and spiritual practitioners from all traditions remain healthy, harmonious, and uh, be successful in fulfilling their spiritual aspirations. May these and other world environments be free of all kinds of unwanted pains and problems, and may beings find peace, happiness, prosperity, and spirituality. Andorna, magi sanje thamji, dingi sanje wale thone, sanje je kumbaram bage tobi juru chuti. In short, we dedicate our collective marriage for all kind mother sentient beings to be free from the fears and dangers of two types of mental obscuration and may we all reach complete enlightened state quickly. <laughs> Please hang up and try again. 